Church family, I'm Tiffany, and welcome to our online service. Today, we have a special guest speaker, Brian Enderly, and we can't wait to hear what he has to share with us. But first, I just wanted to share with you what's coming up at our church. First, we have a membership class coming up next Sunday, April 30th, from 1 to 4 p.m. here at UCC. Church membership is a formal commitment to Jesus' church family. You state before God and others that you are a part of this local body of believers. Joining a church says, I am committed to this church family and they are committed to me. I am here to give more than to get. At UCC's membership class, led by Pastor John, you'll learn more about the story, vision, and ministry of UCC. You'll learn more about our denomination, the Evangelical Covenant Church, and more about what it means to be a member. Then at the end of the class, you will have the option if you want to apply to become a member. You can visit ucov.com slash membership for more information and to sign up. Also, we are really excited about our all church event called RSVP A Spacious Life on Saturday, May 13th from 9.30 to 12.30. Everyone is invited to come and spend some extra time with your church family over food, coffee, and fellowship while author and speaker Ashley Hales encourages us all. Also, Ashley wanted to send a quick message with more about what she's going to be sharing. Hi, University Covenant Church. My name is Ashley Hales, and I am delighted that I will get to be with you in a few short months in May to think about how do we live in our neighborhoods? How do we love our neighborhoods? How do we be a part of our communities? But how we also recognize that our limits are the things that actually lead to flourishing. I can't wait to think more deeply about how our limits are good and how they actually help us love both God and our neighbor. So I cannot wait to hang out with you. In the meantime, you can always find out more about me and my work at my website at aahales.com. I'll see you soon. Bye. So we really hope to see you there. Early bird tickets are available before May 1st for only $20 per person. You can register at ucov.com slash RSVP. Now, as we continue in our service, will you please join me in prayer? God, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather and to watch this church service online. Um, Lord, wherever we're watching from, we just pray um, that we would feel your presence with us, that you would speak to us. Um, God, open our ears and our hearts to hear as Brian speaks today. Um, we just pray um, that we feel closer to you, that we feel challenged in our faith. Um, and God, just thank you for the opportunity um, to listen to the words of the sermon and to hear the words from your scripture. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Morning. My name is Brian Enderly. I'm one of the humanoids at this church. It's great to be here. It's a picture of my family. Uh, you might be surprised, but someone married me. I was also able to procreate. I know, God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, may, we've been married about 18 and a half years. And I don't know, we couldn't remember, but several years into our marriage, Peggy said something to me. She said, oh, Brian, we haven't had much pillow talk lately. I was like, oh, pillow talk. Okay, I can do this. Pillow talking. I got this, strong. So I saved up. I said, I'm not going to say anything during the day. I will save it all till my head hits the pillow. And then I'm going to unload all this talky talk. And uh, I did that for a while because I wanted to win. And then Peggy ended up saying after a while, hey, Brian, do you think pillow talk means talking when your head's on the pillow? I was like, uh what is this thing called pillow talk? Well, if you're like me, I really need this passage, Exodus 19, because Moses is going to help me with pillow talk. And I think uh, we all need it because uh, God, whenever God shows up, a decision or change has to be made. Uh, if you have a paper Bible or electronic Bible, you might want to turn there. There's actually some cool things in the passage and different translations translate a little bit differently. So it'll be fun to see. Uh, and we're not going to look at all the verses, but most of the verses in this chapter. And uh, actually, when after I had sent 
my stuff to Pastor John, he sent me uh, a podcast on this by the Bible Project called Testing at Mount Sinai, if you want to check it out. And they go over a lot more of the contextual information that I don't have the space to today because Pastor John said I can't be up here for two hours. So uh, you can check that out if you want to. But I'll give you a little spoiler. It ends terribly. So the end of it is bad. It's very poor. Uh, but And I believe God actually got potentially a little upset here at the Israelites, and we'll see their story. But before we get there, let's look at the beginning of the story. So we're going to flip over or scroll over, whichever is your case, to Exodus 19, verse 1. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. Verse 2. And Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. So a little context, the Israelites had just been freed from slavery by God. They had been redeemed and brought out, and that might be the story you know of uh, Moses in the burning bush and escaping, you've seen Prince of Egypt or Ten Commandments or something like that. And they're going now, and they've just arrived at Mount Sinai. By the way, that's where Moses had met God at the burning bush. So coming back kind of full circle. And they're there. Uh, Notice a couple things. It says, do you notice it says in the third month? So God actually redefined time here. So he came up with a calendar that didn't exist before. And now since that salvation, that redemption moment, it had been three months. And now that's the calendar, calendar that they continue to use. And then they camp. Actually, the place uh, translates to palm of the hand. So in the palm of the hand of Mount Sinai, or of God. And they're about to have an experience with God. And uh, in your bulletin, or somewhere, if you'd like, I encourage you to draw the passage as I explain it, because there's a lot of things happening. There's going to be a mountain. (laughs) There's going to be a lot of traveling around the mountain and things going on. So if you'd like to draw it, uh, or if that helps you focus, please do so. All right, so... Exodus chapter 19. Let's go over to verse 3. See what happens. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord Yahweh called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you are to speak to the Israelites, Moses. And so Moses carries this message. And let's take, before we get into what he said, let's take a look at a couple things. Do you see where it says, obey me fully? I don't know, your translation might say something different. It might say obey, hearken, something like that. It's actually a Hebrew word that is repeated twice, shema, shema. And it has semantic overlap with words in our English language like listen, hear, obey. So God's basically like, listen, listen, everybody. I'm about to tell you something. And then uh, he tells them this, and it's a little bit shocking. He says, I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests, essentially, or you're going to be priest kings, which is, uh, and this will happen, just continue to keep this covenant with me. Remember, this is a new God to them. They had just escaped Egypt. They're on the getting to know you phase here. So they're the start of their relationship. And uh, God says, hey, I'm going to offer you to be priests. Now, I need some help from the Bible nerds here. Uh, Bible nerds, you might know that God, at a point in history, uh, appointed a certain people group or tribe of Israel to be the priests. Who were those people? The Levites. Thank you, nerds. We appreciate you uh, for your knowledge. 
the Levites were the people who later we find out were to be the priests. But at this point, God actually had intended everyone to be priests. So quite different than the later part, latter part of the story. But everyone was to be a priest or a priest king. Uh, qu- things turned out a bit differently, and we'll see why. So in verse 7, it said, So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words that the Lord Yahweh had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. So uh, Moses relayed the idea. Everyone's like, this is great. We love it. We're going to do all this stuff. We're going to be in relation with this God that we're getting to know. We're going to be these priests. Fantastic. And Moses, by the way, is actually the good example in the passage, and we'll see this play out. But he's the good example of someone who's relating to God. Do you notice him going up and down the mountain? Uh, From chapters 19 to 24, Moses goes up and down the mountain seven times. So Moses is quite the hiker. If you like hiking, you'll like Moses. So, uh, and Moses was the example of how to relate to God. Did you notice he was interacting with God? I bet Moses knows what pillow talk is. Moses. So uh, Moses is the good example, and we'll see that play out a bit. So let's, so God uh, is now going to enact a plan, and we're going to look at verse 10 and see what plan or idea God is enacting. So check this out. And the Lord Yahweh says to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord Yahweh will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Verse 12, put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Because whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. Verse 13, only when the ram's horn or trumpet sounds a long blast, they may approach the mountain. Okay. Before we go on, let's, one little phrase to tackle. Do you see in mine, it says approach the mountain. You can take a look at what it might say in your translation. A lot, a lot will say to go to the mountain. Um, but actually the literal or the best translation would be to go up on the mountain. And uh, again, if you want to nerd out with the Bible Project podcast, you can learn more about that. But for our purposes, to go up on the mountain. Okay, so let's understand what God's plan is and what his idea is for them. He wants them to first prepare themselves or consecrate. And often water or washing things is a common way to kind of prepare. Get ready. In three days, this is all going to go down. What's going to happen after three days? It says God's going to come down in a cloud. Your, your Bible might say thick cloud or dense cloud or something like that. It's really cloud in a cloud. So he's going to come down in a cloud of a cloud, whatever that is, and come and land on the top of Mount Sinai on the third day. And then there's a boundary around the mountain, and they're not to cross that boundary until the third day. So let's imagine the stage is that boundary, like the stage is the mountain. Uh, If I, before the third day, before I'm finished preparing, if I go up here, dead, okay? If I go like this, dead, okay? Over here, dead, okay? I've got to stay away from the mountain and not cross the boundary until the horn sounds, okay? Does everybody got that? I can't go up, according to God, until that third day when the horn sounds. Then it's all, it's open. Go for it, Okay, you go up on the mountain and meet God. But first you have to prepare yourself. So, and go through this consecration period. So, in sum, don't go up the mountain. Prepare yourself. If you try to go up the mountain, you're going to die until that third day when the horn uh, goes off. Then you can go up and we're all good. Okay. And notice Moses has been going up and down the mountain. Now, a few times by this point. He's hiked it quite a bit. So he's, again, the example. 
of what can happen. He's having that direct interaction with God. He's talking to God directly. Okay, so here we go. Let's see how it goes down. Verse 16. On the morning of the third day, this is what we've been waiting for, there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud. There's the cloud I told you about over the mountain. So God had just landed and a very loud trumpet blast. That's what they've been waiting for. Everyone in the camp ran up the mountain. They were excited. Unfortunately, no. You would think that's what might have happened, but everyone in the camp, it says they trembled. They were afraid. And they didn't even attempt to go up the mountain. Luckily, Moses was there. Moses again. Moses, thank goodness, leads people out to the foot of the mountain. Not sure. As we'll see later, it seems like they would not have even done that. Okay, so he leads them out to the foot of the mountain. And uh, again, it was covered with smoke. It was fiery, etc. And uh, again, the trumpet grew louder and louder. And Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. Okay, so on the third day, there was this loud blast. I don't know if you've noticed, but it blasted three times. This is like the worst news alarm you've ever had. So you know when you're sleeping and then it's time to get up, the alarm goes off, you hit the alarm, and then maybe nine minutes later, it goes off again. Well, in this case, this news alarm, God's news alarm does not work like that. You hit the alarm and it just gets louder. And you hit it again and it gets louder again. So uh, God is really trying to get their attention. Uh, And I wanted to compare this from maybe a heavenly perspective. Maybe if, If I'm watching from heaven, what would I think? Versus what's the perspective of the people there? So if I'm watching from heaven, I've just heard all this. Maybe I'm in the throne room. It was a good day. I'm holy that day. So I'm in the throne room. I'm listening. The horn has just went off. I know that I'm expecting the people to come up and they don't. So I'm like, God, sound the horn again. Maybe they didn't hear it. Maybe God, be more cloud-like. Be more fiery. And I'm wondering, what is going on? This was clear. They said, we will do this. Everybody agreed. But then they were stopped at the foot of the mountain. Well, maybe from the people's perspective, it's a little bit different. So from their perspective, they're entering into a new relationship. They might be a little bit nervous. I don't know if you've been in the situation before. Maybe you're just about to get married and you're like, wow, this is a big relational step. Or I'm going to a new workplace. Or I'm joining a new club, like a new bike club. Or I'm going to something I haven't been before. What will the people think of me? Will I be accepted for who I am? And it's a little bit nerve-wracking to take that relational step. Well, that could be a little bit of how they felt, but they were for sure nervous. They were trembling. They did not take that step. They chose when there was fear and when there was faith, they chose fear. Well, this resulted in a major plot turn, an unfortunate plot turn that we're going to see in the next verse. Let's take a look at what happened because they did not go up. This is verse 20 now. The Lord descended on the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top. Moses going up the mountain again. So Moses went up, 21. And the Lord, Yahweh, said to him, go down. Um, Oh, uh, let me, uh, yeah, verse 20. And Go down and warn the people that they do not force their way back through and see the Lord, and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. So finally, God had had enough, and Moses was the one who went up. The rest of them did not. God warned them, I would even dare to say, was a bit upset at how it went down. And because the people said they would do this, and they did not. Now, uh, my Western mind likes things kind of written chronologically, but this was not written by a Westerner. And uh, there's a little actually flashback to this scenario that gives us a little bit more information of what happened. And that's in chapter 20. 
I will read it to you. It's not on the screen. It says in 20 verse 18, it relives this moment. And they had seen the thunder. They saw the smoke. And it says the Israelites trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance. And here they said something quite crazy to Moses in 19. They said to Moses, speak to us yourself. We will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. The people remained at a distance. So if there's the mountain, that's the stage. You could go on the mountain. You could be at the foot of the mountain. It says twice, they remained at a distance to the mountain. They stayed back. And they even said, we don't want to talk to God. Moses, you talk to God for us. You tell us what to do, and we'll do that thing. But we don't want to talk to God. So this whole relational thing that God was setting up did not happen. It would be as if, uh, you know, you're at a kind of some wedding ceremony or something like that, and the groom says, oh, no, I don't want to talk to this person. Maybe I'll find a substitute person to talk to you. I will not do that. So, unfortunately, they stood at a distance, and there's a few reasons, I think, why. They uh, stuck with the law instead of moving forward to the promise. If you take a look at verse 23, there at the bottom of the screen, Moses said to Yahweh, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us, put limits around the mountain, and set it apart as holy. So even Moses, I think, got a little confused and thought, hey, you told us not to go up, which is true, until the trumpet blasts. And they got so focused on the part of not crossing the boundary or staying away from the mountain where God was that they didn't take the next step into the promise. They were blinded and couldn't see that there was a promise for them. You see... Uh, the pillow, it's not about the pillow. The pillow just represents our relationship. And I, like a robot, am like, I will be a husband. I will put my head on the pillow and talk. When I didn't listen and realize that Peggy was asking for a more relationship, more connection, and not the mechanics of going through it. Does that make sense? They wanted the law and they could not get past the law to the promise of being priests. They were stuck at the law point. So they were afraid of the one law given, don't go across the boundary. And they didn't get past, well, when, the, when you're done preparing, come up the mountain. So they focused on the law, they ignored the promise, and they preferred the law over the relationship. Moses, you talk to God for us. We don't want that. Even Moses got confused. So this led to huge theological implications for them. Two big ones that I thought of was, one, uh, Bible nerds, if you're back, um, the next chapter, Exodus 20, is known for what's famous about it. Ten Commandments. They wanted law, they got law. They got Ten Commandments. If you read the next couple chapters, there's almost four straight chapters of laws contained within four books of, generally, laws. They wanted to know what to do. Moses told them what to do. They wanted law instead of the promise. They got it. Laws aren't bad in and of themselves, but that's how they chose to relate to God. They got a total of 613 laws in the Old Testament. There was no law to that magnitude before this point in the story. It was just, it ballooned out at, at that point. The second thing they lost out on was the priesthood. They missed out on the priesthood. As we mentioned before, as our friends mentioned, the Levites, a certain group of people, instead of everyone, became priests. We didn't really define what priests are. But priests are those people who mediate to God for, on behalf of others. 
So the priest goes to talk to God and relates that information to the people, just like Moses was doing. Everyone could have done that, but they didn't want to. So it ended up going to a select group of people to do so. So they lost out on the priesthood. They forwent that opportunity. Uh, myself, when I was younger, I, I can't remember when, but I think it was around seven or eight, I thought, hey, I'm a pretty good kid. I actually don't get in trouble. Like I've seen, I saw my other friends, they were spanked. They were disciplined, grounded, all kinds of stuff. I didn't really, I noticed I didn't really get in trouble. And then I had this thing on the side. I, I didn't really learn much about it, but I, knew, I had heard of Jesus. And I knew that he was a good person too. He didn't really get in trouble. And I started to think, wait a minute, am I Jesus? <laughs> As a kid, I mean, that just made sense to me. But in my human condition, I realized, you know, just looking back on it, my human condition inclined me to think of someone else through regulations, through what they did. I was just naturally inclined to think that way. And so I thought Jesus was all about what he did. And I forwent, I missed, I had no idea that there was something to do with relating to God. It just didn't connect. There was, it did not compute that that could be possible. Peggy has borne the benefits of that thought. And it has, I had to learn that, oh, like following these regulations versus having relationship can be different things. So how about us? What keeps us from meeting Yahweh or God face to face? Sometimes it's the fear of what God might ask us to do. Like, how is this going to change me? Or sometimes we don't even consider God. We don't even go to the base of the mountain. We're at, we're at a way distance. Sometimes I uh, ask people, like, tell me about your connection with God. What's that like? My most common thing that I hear are, well, I pray, devotionals. Sometimes, like, I go to church, quiet times, things like that. And in my mind, at least, <laughs> I think, are is God just about the rules and the laws you've set up for yourself? Do you have a certain quota to fill? Because telling me about what you do with God doesn't tell me about the quality of your relationship. Do you see the difference? Not that those praying is bad. I'm not saying that. That can help foster the relationship. But telling me that's what you do is not telling me what it's like between you and God. Imagine I had a best friend, and you asked me, oh, why is this person your best friend? And I say, well, I have a scheduled appointment to see them every Monday. It just doesn't make sense. That's not why they're my best friend. That helps foster our relationship, but that thing does not make us friends. Is that all right? So it's different, and the Israelites were similarly choosing that sort of thing. So will you keep standing at the foot of the mountain? Or will you go up on the mountain? Uh, check out, if you've been drawing along, what you have drawn, or in your mind what you have. Where are you right now? In the last couple months, where have you been with regards to God and the mountain, so to speak? And where do you want to go? By the way, those who have kind of connected to this, what, uh, what day is it on the... Uh, that's the, all this is happening? What day is all the fire and all the cloud and stuff happening? It's the third day. The third day is a day of significance, uh, literary-wise in Scripture. It's kind of the day that God shows up, and it's decision day. Um, let me give you an example. Luke 24, 45, when Jesus was speaking to two folks after the resurrection... And they were trying to figure out stuff. And on the, uh, it says this. He opened up their minds to understand the scriptures. And then he, Jesus, said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ will suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his, Jesus' name, 
to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You see, the third day has major significance. It's repeated three times in our Exodus 19 chapter. It signifies God's about to show up, and then it's decision day for us. There's new life. There's something coming with God. And that even today, you and I have to make a decision of what we're going to do with God. We can, in fact, actually enter back into the priesthood. So something Jesus, in fact, has done something theologically to, and historically to bring that day back again. If you didn't know it, Exodus 19 is actually quoted by Peter in the New Testament. And he says this in Peter 2, 9 and 10. You are a chosen people. Again, from 19, Exodus 19, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So for a second time in history, we can enter the priesthood. Because of what Jesus has done, we can have that priesthood opportunity again or engage with God relationally. So what to do? Well, realizing this is good, and I think being here is God getting your attention. God is getting our attention and say, hey, it's that third day. <laughs> it is time to decide. Uh, and even now, you can be spending moment, a few moments in God's love, in God. Like, what is God trying to get your attention about? You see laws, structures, regulations, traditions, all these things uh, aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves. The problem is if we forget why we're doing them in the first place. If we forget why we're doing these things in the first place, then they start to become the center, and the reason why we're doing them slips out with our memory. See, it's actually because of our relationship with God that we do these in the first place. They're a byproduct of that. You know, if you are married, you might have a date night, but the date night doesn't make you married. If you have a best friend, you hang out with that best friend maybe at a certain time, but that time that you're hanging out doesn't make that person a best friend. You see, God desires to meet us face-to-face -face or relationally, but we tend to circumvent that and turn that into a set of rules and regulations or do's and don'ts. And that, unfortunately, becomes the center. So where are you at at the foot? Are you at the foot of the mountain? Are you on the mountain? Are you standing at a distance? Uh, as I mentioned, I want all of us to have the opportunity to respond and decide. Uh, so if you could, if you're able, could you stand with me for a moment? Everyone who's able. I want to pray. Uh, first, I want to call out those of you who would call yourselves, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. Um, but maybe you haven't quite been there as far as like, I've got a little, I've got my center off. I've been a little off recently. And you just want to commit to metaphorically going on the mountain with God. If that's you, I want to pray for you. Could you raise your hand if you'd like me to pray for you? Send God's love. Yeah, see you. Amen. Let me pray for you. Continue to stay standing. Lord Jesus, I pray for these folks who say, I want to sit in your love. I want to be with you and relate to you, Lord God, Yahweh. I want to know you more and more, Jesus. Thank you for what you've done in my life. I pray that you renew my faith again and refresh it. Help me, Jesus. We pray this. Amen.
Now remain standing for a moment. I also want to pray for those of you who do not know God. Maybe you're seeking, you're interested, or you've known God a long time ago, but it's just been a while. And uh, some space has passed, some time has passed. Uh, I just need to ask, is there anybody in that situation? You want me to pray for you? Maybe you've been at a distance and you want to come up the mountain. Anyone like that? You want to raise your hand? Okay, I see you. Anyone else? Let me pray for you. Uh, let's all pray. If you're near someone who raised their hand, you can extend your blessing to them as well. Lord Jesus, thank you. These folks who raise their hand. Pray along with me. Lord, uh, thank you for what you've done. I want to know you. I want to come up the mountain. I don't want to stand at a distance. Lord, receive all the wrong that I have done or that has been done to me. Cleanse me of it. Prepare me. Consecrate me because I'm ready to come up. Lord, I receive this faith. I receive you and the new life that you bring through Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.